Chapter 8. Gold By the beginning of 1947, I'd been away from my hometown for over seven years. I reflected often on the role my parents played in my upbringing and the opportunity they'd given me to pursue the path of Buddhist practice. I felt a strong desire to demonstrate my deep gratitude. There is, of course, nothing so profound as the care and affection of parents for their children. Without the care and love of my parents, who would have fed me when I was young and tended to me when I was sick? My parents looked after me when I didn't know what was going on around me and couldn't fend for myself. They raised me and taught me how to speak and think for myself. And of course, they introduced me to Buddhism. Now that I'd had a chance to put the Buddha's teachings into practice, my heart had come to realize an amazing happiness. All of this was made possible by the power of deep parental love. Honoring my parents for all they did for me was the least I could do to repay their constant care and affection. Due to my chosen vocation, I had never succeeded in giving them wealth and security like a good, faithful son normally would. Instead, I had what I considered to be the best repayment of all to offer them. I wanted to teach them about the wonders of Buddhist practice and help instill the Dhamma securely in their hearts. By coincidence at that time, I happened to meet a monk from my hometown who informed me that my mother was sick, and so it seemed appropriate that I return home and visit my parents. I also felt the absence of a John Lee in my life. He taught me many inspiring Dhamma lessons and pointedly steered me in the direction of a John Mun. I sincerely hoped to meet up with him when I returned. With these aims in mind, I began the long trek from the northeast region back to my hometown in Chantaburi on the southeast coast, a walking distance of over 400 miles. I covered the whole trek on foot by the quickest route possible, camping out in Dutanga fashion along the way. Traveling in those days was arduous because the dirt roads were in a constant state of disrepair. Few motor vehicles even attempted to traverse those poor conditions, leaving the muddy, potholed tracks to foot traffic and bullock carts. When I finally arrived in Chantaburi, I took up residence at Saingam Forest Monastery, the place where my life as a monk had begun ten years before. When my parents heard of my return, they rushed to the monastery to greet me, crying while asking me how I was and why I hadn't kept in touch with them. They said they had no idea whether I was alive or dead. You should have at least let your mother know that you were still alive, my mother said with tears streaming down her cheeks. She wiped her eyes as she looked at me reproachfully. I reminded my mother that she had cried when I left home seven years before. So now that I was safely back, why was she still crying? I chided her that if I had continued to stay home that whole time, she would probably have cried even then. I advised her to let go of the past. I was back now, and that was all that mattered. My mother sat still, listening and blinking her eyes as they welled up with tears. She spoke to me about her failing health and how worry and concern had made her miss me even more. Had I died before setting eyes on you again, I would have been distraught. When I'm feeling sick, I cannot help thinking about my children. Should any of them be unaccounted for, I'd be beside myself with grief. Then with a timid smile, she asked, By the way, what did you learn from a John Mon when you stayed with him? The two monks who had been left in charge of Syangam Forest Monastery's upkeep when a previous abbot departed helped me to settle in comfortably. I had lived with them for only a few weeks when they expressed a fervent desire to visit Ajahn Mandi in the northeast to pay their respects and listen to his Dhamma talks. They had questions about their meditation practice that they felt only he could answer. They were delighted that I'd returned to the monastery because it gave them a chance to pass their responsibilities on to me while they traveled north. Since I'd already spent many years with a John Mond, it made sense that I offer them this opportunity. So I agreed to be the temporary abbot at Saingam Forest Monastery in their absence. I dedicated the next two years of my life to maintaining the monastery in good order and attending to the religious needs of my parents and the lay devotees who regularly attended the monastery to offer food in the morning.
I resolved from the start to take these everyday responsibilities seriously. I curtailed the wilder side of my nature and remained courteous in my speech and sympathetic in my interactions with members of the local community, patiently performing the ritual roles expected of a village abbot. At the same time, in order to create the most peaceful and secluded environment possible for monastic training, I reduced contact with the lay community to a minimum. Lay people were welcome to come to the monastery in the morning to offer food and request teachings or advice from me after I finished the meal. Otherwise, I asked that they did not visit as I found constant daytime interruptions from the lay community to be incompatible with the quiet and seclusion required for a monk's meditation practice. My strict policy resulted in a lack of distractions for the resident monks and maintained the sanctity of their meditation environment. Following a lifelong tendency to seek seclusion and solitude, I left behind my monastic responsibilities during the cold season months and ventured alone into the nearby mountains to fully immerse myself in Dutanga meditation practices. I refocused my attention solely on the development of deep levels of concentration and on the intensive application of wisdom techniques. I journeyed on foot through local wilderness areas for several months, living simply and in harmony with nature, relying on the kindness of small forest communities to provide sustenance for my wandering lifestyle. When the next rainy season retreat period approached, I made my way back to Saingam Forest Monastery and resumed my monastic duties as before. Following the 1948 rains retreat, I again took the opportunity to put aside my administrative responsibilities and spend time alone in the wilderness areas to the north. By then, the heat and humidity of the monsoon season had begun to ease off, signaling the onset of the cold season. The cooler, drier weather was a welcome relief, but more relieving still was the sense of solitude experienced in the seclusion of forested mountain ranges. After months of living a sedentary life and managing the monastery's diverse affairs, I was ready to seek sanctuary in a wandering, meditative lifestyle and the peace and quiet of solitude. By the early months of 1949, I had penetrated deep into the jungle terrain of Chantaburi's northernmost district. I'd been hiking on remote trails for months, and my meditation was back to full strength. One evening, while I was seated on the ledge beneath an overhanging rock, my mind experienced an occurrence that left a lasting impression on me. I was meditating non-stop at that time, trying to uproot the remaining defilements that obstructed my path. Suddenly and unexpectedly, my mind dropped into a state of profound stillness, where not a single thought disturbed its sublime tranquility. Except for a very refined awareness that seemed to suffuse everything throughout the entire universe, absolutely nothing else appeared. The whole world appeared to be filled with this subtle quality of knowing, the effect of which was truly amazing. Whether I actively investigated the body or rested quietly in samadhi, stray thoughts did not intervene. The mind remained effortlessly bright and clear for hours. From that day forward, the mind continued to contemplate all aspects of the body for many hours at a stretch. My concentration was intense and impactful, turning into a relentless driving force as the investigations gathered momentum. Through knowledge and skill gained over time, I knew where in my mind to dig and probe. It was just a matter of precisely locating defilements and extracting them. I felt like an experienced folk doctor who knows where to look for wild roots and herbs growing deep in the jungle. All he has to do is penetrate the tangled vegetation, find them, and pull them up. In this more advanced stage of my practice, my mind remained completely disengaged from peripheral thoughts and emotions, and could thus focus exclusively on whatever appeared in its field of awareness. My body contemplation soon reached the stage where wisdom sprang into action automatically, without conscious intention. The effect was a complete absorption in those investigations both day and night. Wisdom moved through mental images of the body with speed and agility, 
uncovering lingering attachments, grabbing those mental fetters by the scruff of the neck, and forcefully yanking them out. The mind spun relentlessly through every part and every aspect of the body, searching for the root causes of craving and delusion. This is surely what a John Mond had meant when he told me to use the noble truths to smash the body to pieces. I reached the stage where I experienced the mind as though it were totally independent and soaring freely. As amazing as the sense of unhindered freedom appeared, I was reluctant to entirely trust this perception. I felt that nothing should be taken for granted at this stage in the practice. I continued to probe deeper into the mind, giving wisdom full reign to uncover the truth. When I say the mind appeared to soar freely, I mean the mind felt as buoyant as a wisp of cotton wool floating on a cushion of air. Probing deeper into that perception, I realized that although the cotton wisp appeared to be floating independently, it actually relied on air currents to keep it aloft. Without that uplifting support, it would fall back to earth. I also realized that the current state of my practice presented a similar predicament, in the same way that the sense of floating free and independent was an illusion, because its sense of freedom was in fact dependent on other factors. So too were the amazing experiences in my meditation just faulty perceptions, rooted in the mind's fundamental delusion about itself. In other words, I still had crucial work left to do. Shortly after that profound realization, I moved into a shallow, cave-like opening hollowed out of the base of a cliff deep in a dense tropical forest on the south side of Bai Sea Mountain, an area known locally for its deadly malaria outbreaks. The jungle was also home to many dangerous wild animals, such as elephants, tigers, leopards, bears, venomous snakes, and wild boars. I had been warned of all these dangers, but I chose to go anyway to challenge my mind's ability to respond decisively to extreme conditions. Sheltering in the cave, I pushed myself mercilessly, fasting and going without sleep for days at a time, determined not to relax my efforts until I had achieved a further breakthrough. Within days, I had come down with a severe case of malaria, which resulted in alternating bouts of high fevers and shaking chills. Throughout the duration of these punishing symptoms, the sharpness and keenness of my mind became more and more acute and perceptive. On certain occasions, my awareness seemed to disconnect from external sense contact altogether. But normally I could detect a very subtle sensation that's difficult to describe emanating from the physical sphere. My mind thus became fully focused on what appeared to be an exceedingly refined breath sensation. When I was able to hold the sensation steady at that refined level, it became increasingly fainter and more elusive as it faded in and out of awareness. Focusing intently on the faintest of those sensations, I watched them steadily become so indistinct that only a tiny trace of movement was detectable. I continued to delicately probe and question this almost imperceptible sensation until it finally faded into complete and utter stillness. All mental motion ceased. Nothing remained in the sphere of awareness. Nothing lingered to search for. Nothing was left to focus on. All attachment between that totally still awareness and the activities of body and mind had been severed. Awareness was then free, vast, and supremely empty. Without limits, boundless and all-encompassing. Nothing at all enclosed or obstructed it. When everything that had permeated awareness vanished, there was only a genuine, all-pervading emptiness that contained nothing. Emptiness of this kind is a total and permanent disengagement that requires no further effort to maintain. At that unparalleled moment, awareness expressed the highest form of freedom, having absolutely let go of every vestige of primal ignorance, thus overturning the perpetual cycle of birth and death once and for all. After disabling delusion's all-encompassing network of ignorance with one powerful and decisive stroke, 
Wisdom's insight delivered a fatal right hook to the chin of the champion of Sung Sarek existence, knocking it out cold, never again to rise from the mat. In the singularity of that moment, I finally came face to face with the Lord Buddha. I don't mean to boast, but that's the only way I can describe it. I realized unequivocally that attachment to the cycle of birth and death, repeated endlessly over countless lifetimes, was rooted in a universal ignorance of the truth. Free from that attachment now, the world of ignorance no longer found a foothold in an awareness that was absolutely pure and at one with Nibbana. Beyond that, I can find no words to convey the truth, because that singular purity lies outside the realm of conventional language. Ordinary people who try to wrap their heads around it are bound to be left bewildered. I finally rid myself of delusion and confusion by battling toe-to-toe -to -toe with the demon of ignorance until the power of supreme wisdom broke through its last line of defense. Supported by the combined forces of faith, effort, mindfulness, samadhi, and wisdom, all of which had been well-trained during countless lives of Buddhist practice, the ramparts of ignorance were stormed, and the great demon was slain in its previously impregnable Sangsaric fortress. Supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom closed all the pathways through which awareness could escape into sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, and thoughts. This allowed wisdom's forces to battle their way into delusion's inner sanctum and take out the central tyrant, the primary cause of all suffering. When awareness finally let go of body and mind, only the amazingly pure Dhamma remained, an occurrence inexpressibly more astounding than anything I had ever experienced before in my years of meditation. The plaintive song that I had overheard a lady in the North sing many years before rang true. Suffering of body and mind consumes my thoughts and feelings. Suffering binds me so tightly. That suffering, the suffering of body and mind, had now flipped over to become ease of body and mind. The verse, suffering binds me so tightly, had been transformed into happiness embraces me so tightly. My spontaneous reaction was, how incredible. I've seen the truth that I've sought for so long. Nibbana is inherent within the realm of human existence, but it is not something specifically human. Nibbana cannot be found in the elements of earth, water, fire, or wind, nor in anything of the physical universe. Figuratively, we may say that Nibbana is a realm of absolute freedom, but in truth, Nibbana is a natural principle innate within all of us. It has no physical characteristics whatsoever. The five senses cannot know it. Philosophy cannot reveal it. Science cannot verify it. Even extensive study of the Buddha's teachings cannot reach Nibbana unless the teachings are diligently put into practice. Only by practicing Buddhist meditation can the mind make the adjustments needed to realize Nibbana. All of the many past Buddhas and their countless Arahant disciples did just that allowing the truth to arise unequivocally within their minds. If you want to dispel doubts about the ultimate consequences of your actions, you must resolve these uncertainties internally by practicing meditation until you clearly realize the truth of these things for yourself. Even doubts that have plagued you for your whole life will dissipate in a flash at the moment that realization occurs— just as perpetual darkness turns to brightness the moment a light is turned on. The truth of the Buddha's teachings will be revealed to those who practice the teachings with diligence and an unwavering determination to discover the truth. To fully realize the truth about their own potential for release from suffering, seekers of the way must strive to become spiritual warriors on the path to liberation. Their hearts need to have a firm resolve that can boldly stand up to their internal enemies, finding the strength of purpose to fight with all their might, without becoming weakened or disheartened, and without retreating when the struggle appears too difficult. When this kind of fighting spirit is exhibited in the pursuit of Dhamma, 
then time and place are not relevant to the quest for truth. Regardless of whether it is the Buddha's age or our present age, Nibbana can always be attained by those who earnestly follow the way to freedom. The true Dhamma always exists in the present moment, the timeless present, here and now. At the moment awareness passed beyond the tangled jungles of sangsaric existence, wonder and amazement arose in me as I sat alone amidst the mountainous wilderness of northern Champaburi. It was clear that ignorance had ceased creating future births in the various realms of sentient existence. What remained was a completely pure awareness. As the sun rose above the mountain peaks, I bowed deeply in my heart to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, those three absolutely pure jewels which had been fused into the one unconditioned element of Nibbana. A heart filled with Dhamma reflected with immense gratitude on everyone who had so graciously assisted me in reaching the land of freedom. I felt a deep sense of gratitude for the many sacrifices my parents had made on my behalf. It was impossible to assess the value of all their love and care for me. A moment of rapturous joy arose at the thought that I could now truly repay my great debt of gratitude to them. My gratitude for Ajahn Mond's love and compassion knew no bounds. He had taken this worthless-looking old rag, tamed and refined its coarse and clumsy exterior, and polished the gold concealed inside until it had shone forth unhindered in all directions. I felt as though he had given me renewed courage every time I began to falter. He acted as both a mother and father in my times of need, to such an extent that I knew I would never be able to repay even a small part of the debt I owed him. He was living proof of that which knows. Sailing on the raft of his compassionate guidance, my heart had reached the other shore. With the turbulent waves and karmic consequences of greed, ill will, and delusion now left behind, I was free to leave the precious raft behind at the shoreline. How incredible! I continued to reside in that small cave under a cliff in the wilderness, resting serenely in the undefiled bliss of final release from suffering. My heart rejoiced in the peace and quiet of that sparsely populated mountain region where human contact was limited to the folks giving food on my daily alms round. That wild, uncivilized jungle area was inhabited by good, honest, moral people. Even jungles with dense forests, tangled vegetation, and wild animals aren't as dangerous as the civilized jungles of human society. Places overrun with entangling defilements where greed, hatred, and delusion are constantly on the prowl. These ferocious mental tigers inflict deep internal wounds, gradually eroding a person's physical and mental health until the damage becomes acute. Such injuries are extremely difficult to treat. Though the wounds tend to fester menacingly, those who are afflicted usually neglect their injuries, hoping they will somehow heal by themselves. As the 1949 hot season neared and the sweltering heat and humidity began intensifying in the high jungles of northern Chantaburi, I made my way back down to the marshy seashore communities of my youth. Relieved by then from all encumbering burdens, both mental and physical, I somewhat reluctantly returned to Saingam Forest Monastery to resume my responsibilities as temporary abbot of the small monastic community there, which of course meant living again amid the thorns and brambles of mundane society. Initially, I had contemplated taking the excellent Dhamma in my heart and teaching it to the people in my hometown. But eventually I concluded that it was beyond the spiritual power and ability of those people to grasp the radically profound nature of that supreme Dhamma. When I reflected on it, I felt disheartened by the prospect of trying to explain the amazing nature of that attainment to others, and so decided to remain silent when I returned. After taking up my former position as abbot, I began to contemplate my next move. 
By that time I had served as the temporary abbot of Sain Gam Forest Monastery off and on for two full years. The two monks who were supposed to return from Ajahn Mun's monastery to replace me had still not returned. Feeling that I'd already done all I possibly could to repay the debt of gratitude I owed my parents, I decided the time had come for me to wander freely again. As I had no intention to become a permanent abbot in my hometown monastery, I decided that I'd stayed there long enough. My spirit yearned to return to the wilds, to live in caves under overhanging cliffs or beneath shady trees. It occurred to me that I'd never traveled to the south of Thailand. A John Lee Damodaro, who mentored me in my early years as a monk, had spent many years wandering Dutanga in Thailand's southern provinces, so I decided to follow in his footsteps. I hoped to find a quiet, secluded cave in an area where nobody knew me. I felt as free as a bird, released to fly with no attachments to hold me down. My heart felt satiated in every way. Indeed, the Buddha and his Arahant disciples chose to live at ease in the depths of the forest, abiding pleasantly in the here and now. For me, Ajahn Mun had always led the way. Even after he had thoroughly cleansed his mind of all defilements, a time when he could afford to relax in the company of like-minded followers, he chose instead to abide in secluded and tranquil wilderness areas, even though that arduous lifestyle took a toll on his physical health. He simply relied on the power of Dhamma, using its potency as all the noble ones had to maintain the well-being of body and mind. I traveled south by train and disembarked at Sawi district in Chumporn province, located about 300 miles down the southern peninsula. I soon set off hiking into the mountains, camping at suitable sites beside the trail. I occasionally hung my umbrella tent near a villager's garden or in an orchard. I lived off the fruits of my daily alms round like a honeybee, sampling the pollen from one blossom to another without worry or concern. After months of Dutanga wandering in the mountains of Sawi district, I met a group of villagers who led me to a cave deep in a tropical jungle abounding with wild animals. The large cavern there had once been part of an ancient monastery complex, but had long since been abandoned. The villagers invited me to reside there for the upcoming rains retreat and offered to renovate a section of the monastery if I agreed. I accepted the invitation mainly because I liked the cave and its location. Staying in a cave surrounded by dangerous animals would force me to remain alert and mindfully aware. Important elements of abiding pleasantly here and now. Although I'd reached a stage where I could rest in peace and tranquility under all conditions, I still utilized external aspects of Dhamma to keep body and mind healthy and vigorous. I spent the 1949 rainy season retreat at that cave in peace and solitude. No sooner did the retreat end than the same village group invited me to reside there permanently. They promised that if I agreed to stay on, they would raise funds to expand the monastery's living space to accommodate more monks. Seeing the danger of a long-term commitment as more frightening than the danger of wild animals, I slipped away quietly one day and resumed my Dutanga wanderings. I trekked 180 miles further south to Nakhon Si Tamarat province and stayed at Mahayong Monastery for a short while before hiking another 150 miles to Songkla province in the deep south, reaching there in November of 1949. I settled for a while at Huiyang near Ban Pru village in the Hot Yai district. Not long after setting up camp at Huiyang in the second week of November, I had a startling vision of a John Mun a vivid mental image of his pale, dead body lying motionless within an open casket appeared suddenly in my meditation. I witnessed him departing the realm of Sung Sarik existence forever to enter the liberation realm of Anupadisesa Nibbana, the absolute cessation of all suffering. The image was clear and unmistakable. On alms round the next morning, I asked one of the villagers if he'd heard any news about Aijan Mon. Although he had not, I wasn't entirely reassured. 
I had a strong feeling my vision was an omen. I seem to recall him saying that he would die in his 80th year. Upon returning from alms round, as I sat eating the food I'd received, a messenger came to inform me that news bulletins on the local radio were announcing that the venerable Ajahn Manpuridato had passed away the night before at Sudawat Monastery in Sakonnakon. Hearing that, I immediately finished eating and walked straight to the back of the building. There, in private, my chest heaved, and I sobbed as an uncontrollable emotion arose and lodged in my throat, nearly choking me. I felt a terrible sense of loss. A feeling of eternal gratitude and reverence washed over me when I reflected on the departure of the man who had so illuminated my life and brightened my heart. He had always been close at hand and ready to help resolve my doubts and provide me with inspiration. I knew I had to return to Sakon Nakhon immediately. Fortunately, a John Mond senior disciples had arranged to have news of his death broadcast over the radio and printed in the newspapers so that his faithful followers would have access to the news wherever they might be. Even though I was deep in the south of the country at that time, I still had the opportunity to pay my final respects in a timely manner. I boarded a train heading north that day. I stopped over in Chantaburi to meet with Ajahn Lee Damadaro and asked him what course of action he wanted me to take. Night had fallen by the time I arrived. Ajahn Lee was about to preside over a Patimoka recitation of the monk's disciplinary rules. Evidently he was waiting for me to arrive to join them, even though I had not notified him in advance about my plans. The next morning he told Tan Fuang, who had returned to train with Ajahn Li some years before, and me to proceed quickly to Sakon Nakon and help with the funeral arrangements. He planned to join us later. When we arrived at Suda Wat Monastery, we were told that prominent senior monks, in consultation with local government officials, had decided that it would be best to keep Ajahn Mond's body for several months before proceeding with the cremation. An agreement had been reached that the cremation should take place during the time of the waxing moon in January of 1950. In the meantime, a special casket had been arranged to hold the body. I headed straight for the pavilion where a John Mond's body lay in state. As I glanced down into the open casket at Ajahn Mond's still, lifeless body, tears welled up in my eyes and flowed down my cheeks. I was helpless to stop them. I knelt beside the casket and performed three long bows to pay my final respects to the venerable monk who had such a profound impact on my life. All other thoughts evaporated, leaving only an overpowering sense of love and gratitude in that moment of supreme stillness. Outside the pavilion, large kerosene lamps floodlit the monastery grounds where people milled around uncertainly, seemingly lost. I could hear chaotic sounds of grief and lamentation from the crowd of visitors who waited patiently for their chance to go inside and pay their respects to a John Mond's body. In the months leading up to the cremation ceremony, hundreds of monks who also wished to pay him their final respects arrived in Sakon Nakon. Although most then returned home, over a hundred remained, residing in the monastery to help coordinate all the funeral arrangements. The people of Sakon Nakon put forth a concerted effort to make life as convenient as possible for the monks and novices gathered there for the occasion. Despite the large influx of monks, local residents were prepared to support them each day with an abundance of alms food. The line of monks receiving food every morning stretched into the distance, but people remained unstinting in their generosity from the first day to the last. They worked tirelessly and with enthusiasm to ensure that this huge funeral ceremony would be an unqualified success. Well in advance of the cremation date, monks and novices who wished to attend were arriving in large numbers. The cremation ceremony itself was expected to attract a crowd of thousands. Soon after I arrived, a critical shortage of clean water became apparent. Unless sufficient water could be found quickly, 
the monastery compound would soon become unlivable. Seeing that I was still young and robust, a senior monk ordered me to take charge of the search for a reliable source of water. Lay supporters had been digging the ground in random locations with crude picks and long-handled hoes for so long that their hands were raw and blistered, but they still hadn't found groundwater. To avoid wasting time and energy, I decided to focus a combined effort on one promising spot at the edge of the woods, where the group quickly began to dig a wide vertical shaft in search of an underground water source. I also joined in the work, stripping off my shoulder cloth and working bare-chested under the winter sun to fill large wicker baskets with soil from the pit and haul them to the surface by hand. I must have looked like just another layman on the job. But monastic decorum be damned. We had a critical objective to achieve, and I needed freedom of movement to do my part. Once we finally reached an adequate source of groundwater, we were able to provide enough fresh water to last for the three months leading up to the funeral ceremony. I was also tasked with completing construction of the funeral pyre and the main ceremonial pavilion, as well as many small dwellings to house the monks and novices. Several smaller pavilions were constructed to provide shelter for lay participants, and many places to prepare and cook meals were set up around the grounds to provide an adequate supply of food for the large crowd that was expected to attend the important occasion. I was kept so busy for those three months that I hardly found time to rest. But in my heart, I never complained. I saw it as a means of honoring a John Mond's virtuous perfections. As the day of the funeral ceremony drew near, monks and lay devotees flooded in from all directions, their numbers swelling until those charged with receiving them were barely able to cope. The closer it came to cremation day, the greater the multitude pouring into the monastery. In the end, no more space could be found to accommodate the hordes of people who kept arriving. By funeral day, all the huts were full, and the whole extensive tract of forest within the monastery grounds was crowded with monks and novices who had traveled from all over the region. Most of them simply camped out in the woods. In all, well over a thousand monks and novices were present at Ajahn Mondi's cremation. As for the lay devotees, it was simply impossible to count how many were camped inside and outside the monastery grounds. And yet, amazingly, very little of the noise usually associated with such a crowded ceremony was heard. For the duration of the funeral, no instances of drinking or drunken behavior occurred, no quarreling or fighting flared up, and no cases of theft were reported. The entire event proceeded with such good taste and propriety that I couldn't help but imagine the hands of the celestial devas at work. The cremation ceremony preliminaries began on the tenth lunar day of the third lunar month and culminated four days later with the cremation of Ajahn Mond's body at midnight on January 31, 1950. While the special casket containing his body passed through the crowd on its way to its final resting place on the funeral pyre, many in the crowd wept openly, all mourning the loss of an exceptionally noble person the bodily remains being carried to the pyre were all they had left of him, the last vestige of conventional reality still associated with his presence in the world. He had entered the sublime, pure realm of Nibbana. Never again would he return to physical, bodily existence, the land of pain and suffering. The following day, when the fires of the funeral pyre had died down and a John Mond's bone relics had been collected for safekeeping, the gathering of monks and lay devotees began to gradually disperse. I stayed on for several more days, determined to help clean up the monastery compound and leave the place as immaculate as possible, as it would always be the final resting place of the one person who had meant more to me than anyone else in the world. In the days after a John Mond's cremation, the Dutanga monks of his lineage wandered off in different directions, feeling like orphans who'd lost both parents. Most of the younger monks began searching for a reliable teacher to act as a refuge in a John Mond's stead. 
many of them congregated around his senior disciples, whom they had learned to admire and respect. Although these monks ended up scattered across the northeast, their purpose remained the same, striving for the realization of Nibbana. I myself headed south by foot, wandering Dutanga as I always had, until I eventually reached my hometown in Chantaburi province. As my mother's health had continued to deteriorate, I spent a few busy weeks at Sain Gam Forest Monastery, coordinating my mother's health care schedule with my brothers and sisters, who spared no expense of time or money to provide her with the best treatments available. As soon as I was convinced that my services were no longer needed, I approached Ajahn Lee and asked him to help me find a quiet, peaceful monastic setting somewhere in the forested regions of Chantaburi, a place where I could live in seclusion and still wholeheartedly serve the interests of the religion. He advised me to move to a place called Crystal Mountain and take up residence on the hilltop. Ajahn Lee had lived there several years previously. His austere lifestyle had so impressed the locals that they banded together to build a small pavilion and a bamboo hut for his stay. He named the monastery Crystal Mountain because the peaked hilltop appeared to draw the surrounding landscape up to a point of symmetry and concord. I found the monastery deserted, so I moved in straight away. I ended up residing there off and on for the next ten years. By nature, I did not like to remain idle. I soon went to work making improvements to the original buildings and constructing new ones. Mostly I labored on my own, using whatever local materials were available. The original buildings had begun to crumble and decay, succumbing to the hot, humid climate of the jungle. Since the buildings needed stronger foundations, I borrowed an old sledgehammer and spent my afternoons breaking up the large stones scattered around the hilltop. I didn't bother to ask for anyone's help, and no one would have been able to keep up with me even if I had. When I needed lumber for posts and beams or for floorboards, I led a party of village men deep into the forest on the other side of the hill, where they felled trees and sawed the trunks into planks. We usually camped in the jungle overnight, slaving from dawn to dusk every day until the work was completed. We used long, two-man hand saws with wooden handles at each end to cut the big logs into flat boards. As one man pushed and the other pulled, the saw's teeth cut on both strokes to make a clean surface along the entire length of the log. When we had enough planks, we shouldered them through the thick jungle and up the hill to the monastery. The work was back-breaking but worthwhile because hardwood made excellent building material. Because I set very high standards for myself, I could be equally demanding with the work ethic of others. I expected a job to be done quickly and skillfully with no excuses or delays. Even though my helpers were local volunteers, I tended to be a hard taskmaster. I pushed myself to the limit, and everyone else was expected to follow suit. It was not in my character to talk sweetly and offer sympathies. On the contrary, on the occasions when I should perhaps have spoken softly, I yelled loudly instead. We had work to do. I just couldn't be bothered to speak politely. Due to my hard-nosed, tough attitude, the village men were often reluctant to join me when I called on them to help with a work project. If I could have managed it by myself, I would have. But I needed help for the jobs monks weren't allowed to do. I felt the village men should have been grateful for the opportunity to earn spiritual rewards for their hard work. They should have honored the Buddha's teaching on the fruits of meritorious actions. I did my best to repay the hard physical labor that the local people contributed to the monastery. On one occasion I was invited to bless a newlywed couple at their family home. I felt reluctant to attend, but the parents were supporters of the monastery and they were offering a meal. Their house was a typical village structure built on stilts with the main floor raised five feet above the ground. Because I arrived late, the other eight monks who'd been invited had already taken their seats on the floor above, and the rest of the house was full of family members milling around. The staircase going up to the main floor was bustling with women and children. Piles of cast-off shoes littered its base. Because the building was elevated on wooden posts, 
The upstairs floor stuck out at the level of my chest and was enclosed at the top by a guardrail about three feet tall. Since I had no intention of waiting for the crowd on the staircase to make way, and I didn't want to elbow my way through that crowd to find my seat upstairs, I simply reached out, grabbed the base of the guardrail with my hand, and pulled my whole body up until my right knee rested on the edge of the floor upstairs. With my alms bowl slung around my neck and resting behind one shoulder, I raised my body to a standing position, swung one leg over the top rail, and straddled it under my crotch. With my legs swinging freely on either side of the railing, I pivoted and hopped down on the floor, to the speechless astonishment of all the monks and guests present. I quickly took my seat at the head of the row of monks, surveyed the disorder of family and friends moving about laughing and greeting one another, and cut the whole scene short by bellowing out, Do you want the monks here to chant or not? If not, just bring in the food so we can eat. Since the owner obviously wanted us to bless his kids with auspicious chants, he was shocked by the sudden interruption. He blurted out, Yes, please, sir. I felt indifferent to his embarrassment. If all he really wanted was an auspicious future for the married couple, then there was sufficient merit in offering a meal to the monks, even without the chanted blessing. What was the purpose of the chants supposed to be anyway? To bless the sexual exploits of a couple so they could make a family, grow old, get sick, and die like everyone else in this world of pain and suffering? In the end, we intoned the ritual chants and ate the meal without further comment. When the time came to leave, the upper floor was still congested, and the stairs leading down still crowded. What to do? My only option was to leave the house the same way I'd entered. With my bowl hanging from my neck, I straddled the railing again, arched one leg over the top, and gripped the railing to swing down to the ground. I could tell the young monks were embarrassed to watch a senior monk behave that way, but I felt unperturbed. Under the circumstances, it was the only sensible action to take. I probably reached the monastery before the other monks had even left their seats. It felt awkward and out of character for me to always address people in a polite and deferential manner, as though I had to pretend to be someone I wasn't. I never spoke with harmful intentions or hidden agendas. Just straight talk, no bullshit. For instance, an elderly matron from the royal palace in Bangkok showed up one day at Crystal Mountain Monastery while I was working on a construction project. The occasion was her birthday, for which she wanted to make merit by offering a donation. Having come directly from work, I was underdressed for the occasion. I wore an old and soiled waist cloth with the shoulder cloth hitched up high around my neck. I probably looked more like the gardener than the abbot, the lady, on the other hand, was painted up like one of the china dolls my mother kept on display in her glass cabinet at home. Never one for formality, I began hawking and spitting tobacco juice into an old rusty tin can as we spoke. The poor lady looked alarmed. I could tell she was being very critical in her assessment of my conduct. Perhaps she was offended as well. I was happy that she had the chance to make merit for her birthday but I could see that was the extent of her interest in coming to the monastery. Had she asked about Dhamma practice, that would have been another matter. I could be articulate when it came to the higher purpose of teaching Dhamma, but small talk was a waste of my time. When I needed a ride to take care of business somewhere in the district, I usually flagged down a passing truck on the road outside the monastery's gate. I found the easiest way to get the driver's attention was to stand in the middle of the road and wait for him to stop. As soon as he did, I quickly hopped on board, no permission asked. The driver had no choice, really. He couldn't run over a monk. Besides, I treated everyone I met as though they were a friend or a relative. I saw us all as equals, as companions in birth, aging, sickness, and death. All living beings were the same in that respect. Hell, I'd hitch a ride with an elephant if I could. Straddling the middle of the road with my legs spread apart while I adjusted my upper robe over both shoulders, I stopped whichever vehicle passed first, a farm truck headed to market, a local bus going to town, or a car of any kind. 
Once my business was finished, I returned to the monastery by the same means. One day, I received an urgent telegram from the Royal Damayut Monastery in Bangkok, requesting that I go there immediately. As Crystal Mountain Monastery was a full day's drive from Bangkok, I quickly walked to the road and stopped a ten-wheel truck hauling fruit the long distance to the capital. When I found the cab crowded with passengers, many of them women, I hoisted myself up onto the truck bed and took a seat cross-legged on the roof of the cab. There I remained the whole day, the hot sun beating down on my head and the wind blowing in my face. By the time we reached Bangkok, I was worn out. To get from the fruit market to the royal monastery, I hailed the first taxi that passed by and jumped in. I didn't carry any money, of course, so the cabbie was in for a surprise. Heck, he was also a companion on the journey from birth to death, so I had no doubt that we'd work it out like brothers. I had been summoned to Bangkok to join a delegation of senior monks that was scheduled to attend a meal offering at the royal palace. When the royal representative arrived to escort us to the palace, I asked him if I would be required to take a monk's ceremonial fan for the occasion, as I assumed it was the proper etiquette. But he said no, just go as you are. I was fine with that. But during the royal ceremony, when the monks sat down to chant the blessing just before the meal began, one of the palace officials overseeing the ceremony pointed to me and asked loudly, Why doesn't that monk have a fan? Just as loudly, I shot back for all to hear. Stop! Everybody stop! We can't proceed until I retrieve my fan from the monastery. My outburst spoiled the formal dignity of the occasion, stunning monks and royal householders alike. Softly and sternly, the palace official asked me why I had spoken up. I barked back. I damn well asked before coming whether I needed a fan or not and was told no, so I didn't bring one. Heads hung and faces turned red, as the royal family solemnly carried on offering the meal. What is a fan, anyway? It's a badge of esteem used in formal monastic rituals. I had put up with those fans for ceremonial events, as they were promoted by the hierarchy of the administrative sangha to denote rank and scholastic achievement. Such achievements were hollow in the view of practicing forest monks, however. Did Ajahn Mond esteem the ranks that were bestowed on monks? Hardly. He respected levels of meditative achievement, samadhi ranks and wisdom status. Real achievement comes from an internal struggle that involves effort, discipline, and great enthusiasm. This path leads to the inner strength needed in the fight to increase wisdom and lessen ignorance. The only true badge of honor, then, is the attainment of absolute freedom. Living at Crystal Mountain Monastery, I was free to leave my ritual fan tucked away in a storage cabinet. The Dutanga monks who visited me never lugged one along when they came. We greeted and recognized each other by the Dhamma virtues in our hearts. Life at Crystal Mountain Monastery turned into an ongoing construction project. The only structurally sound building standing on the property when I arrived was the small pavilion where the monks gathered for meals and chanting. Even that was in poor condition. The few monks' huts that remained were falling apart. Roofs leaked and walls were missing. I resolved to renovate the old structures, build new ones, and develop the property into a fully functioning monastic hermitage. I was prepared to shoulder most of the physical burden. The local village headman agreed to provide the monastery with financial resources. I believed it was my duty to achieve success through hard work without wasting money or other resources. We started by upgrading the materials we used to build new residences for the monks. I experimented with mixing and pouring concrete to replace the rickety bamboo huts. Bags of cement were available in the local market. Sand was hauled in from the beaches and, with my trusty sledgehammer, I crushed rocks to provide stone aggregate to complete the mix. It was physically demanding manual labor. Cement, sand, and stone were combined with water in a shallow pit in the ground adjacent to the building site and mixed by hand. 
I pushed and pulled the blade of a long-handled hoe back and forth through the heavy mixture until it became a thick slurry ready to pour. Fresh concrete was scooped into buckets, hauled to the site, and poured into wooden frames to make first the floor and later the walls. Mostly I toiled alone. The village headman was appreciative of my dedicated enthusiasm for the project, but he kept advising me to slow down and take it easy. It was all right to take time off to meditate, he cautioned. To that, I responded that I'd spent my entire monk's life meditating, and there was nothing left to attain. He insisted that I'd gone too far with my insistence on working so hard. Working at that pace, he couldn't find workers willing to help me. I lambasted him and his workers for being lazy bastards who preferred lolling around to working hard. By the time I left Crystal Mountain Monastery many years later, I'd built four concrete monks' residences, a new hardwood pavilion, and a towering concrete ordination hall. In other words, a fully functioning practice monastery. In addition, we planted a small forest of native trees covering the whole hilltop. One of my earliest complaints was the poor quality of the tools that were donated for my use. I was particularly frustrated by the low-grade metal used in making sharp-edged tools like hatchets, axes, and machetes. Within a week of chopping with a new axe blade, the cutting edge began to nick and fracture because the metal was weak and brittle. Shoddy materials and sloppy workmanship were to blame. Fed up with poor quality tools, I decided to take matters into my own hands and become my own blacksmith. Forging steel was a simple trade, but it required enormous strength, which suited my temperament very well. I built a small, charcoal-burning furnace behind my hut. I used leaf springs, salvaged from the suspensions of old trucks because of their high strength, and heated the thick steel plates in the furnace's glowing charcoal until the metal became soft enough to shape using hand tools. When the metal was hot enough, I pulled it out, placed it flat side down on an anvil, and pounded it into shape with a large hammer. Once the metal reached its desired shape, I filed the sharp edge down to remove any imperfections and smooth the surface. I then heat-treated it in the forge one more time to achieve optimal hardness. The tools I made were far more durable than those sold at the market. Some idiots accused me of violating monastic discipline. They claimed the Buddhist monastic code forbade monks from forging their own tools. Nothing could be further from the truth. These are common monks' requisites. I made them for a useful purpose. How could there be a fault? I did not use them to kill living beings. I did not sell them to make a profit. Having done nothing unskillful in their making or in their use, how could my conduct be wrong? Besides, pounding red-hot metal bars into tools can be a Dhamma teaching. Think about it as pounding your defilements and laziness into submission. In the end, I gave most of my axes and hatchets away to other monks. Where was the harm? Even today, at a ripe old age, I still enjoy working at the forge behind my residence. My arrival at Crystal Mountain Monastery had initially been greeted with enthusiasm in the surrounding communities, and many of the locals had volunteered to work on my construction crews. But the villagers also had their own work to do and their own lives to live. After the major building projects were completed, the majority of them returned to their mundane affairs and lost interest in the forest monastery on the hill. Villagers were grateful to have an opportunity to put food in the forest monks' bowls in the morning, but most of them didn't expect much more from the religion than that chance to make merit. Nevertheless, a small group of villagers who were deeply inspired by forest monks and their lifestyle did become regular supporters of Crystal Mountain Monastery. In the meantime, a number of monks and novices began to gather around me on Crystal Mountain, and I led them in undertaking an austere and vigorous meditation regimen. I pressed them to eat less, sleep less, talk less, and instead put their effort into sitting and walking meditation. 
Often we sat in meditation or practiced walking meditation from dusk till dawn. This group of monks included some of my earliest disciples. I gave them special attention because I knew the kind of momentum and intensity of effort needed to break through the walls of craving and delusion. I was in no mood for compromise, so I pushed my disciples to their limits. I always told them that if they genuinely aimed for liberation, they would have to courageously stare death in the face. Those who could put up with the pressure stayed on and prospered. Those who couldn't soon left. The early disciples who persevered in putting my teachings into practice later became well-respected teachers in their own right and built monasteries and forest hermitages in wilderness areas of the country's northwestern region. I tried to inspire in my disciples an enthusiasm for the training, stressing the patient endurance that was needed for them to succeed in reaching their goal. My aim was to instill in their minds the attitude that every detail has significance and every action has consequences. Nothing was to be done in a lazy, slipshod frame of mind. Attention and careful consideration had to be given to every endeavor. I repeatedly hammered home the message that mindfulness must be sustained in every activity and tirelessly admonished the monks when I caught them being heedless. Ten years after my return to Chantaburi, I felt happy with the results of my efforts at Crystal Mountain Monastery. The growing number of forest monks under my guidance was a good indication that a John Mond's forest monastic lineage was firmly taking root in the southeast. Shortly after the end of the 1960 rainy season retreat, I left the monks I'd trained in charge of Crystal Mountain Monastery, bid farewell to my family, and stepped onto the forest trail leading to the northeast. I intended to visit and pay homage to the disciples of Ajahn Mon that I respected the most. By the start of the rainy season, I had reached Ban Tad Forest Monastery, where I bowed at the feet of Ajahn Mahabua and requested permission to spend the 1961 retreat period there. It was immediately apparent that Ajahn Mahabua had established a thriving community of forest monks, all of whom were striving to maintain the virtues of renunciation, strict discipline, and intensive meditation. Much like Ajahn Mon, Ajahn Mahabua had a reputation for being fierce and uncompromising with his students. He drilled into them the importance of practicing the bold meditation techniques that Ajahn Mon had championed. He was also uncompromising in his opposition to attempts to introduce worldly values into the monastic community. Refusing to practice in line with people's wishes and opinions, he held true to the principles of Dhamma and monastic discipline, and successfully maintained the monastery's atmosphere of concentrated focus. This strict attitude made me feel right at home. Ajahn Mons to caution monks against being influenced by worldly wishes and opinions that aren't based on Buddhist principles or ethical standards. Monks must remind themselves that lay life is a confining and dusty path, one that presents significant challenges to those seeking to tread the monastic path. The stability and strength of our religion have always depended on a community of monks who are completely dedicated to the practice of Buddhism and to teaching that path of practice to others. The stability and strength of the ordained Sangha, in turn, are dependent on its code of discipline which is defined and governed by adherence to a set of precepts designed specifically for monastic living. Those rules outline a disciplined lifestyle that is ideally suited for practical application of the Buddha's teachings. Rather than expediently accepting the lower standards of worldly life, monks choose to adopt the higher principles enshrined in the monastic code of conduct. Otherwise, Communities of practicing monks will lack harmony and discipline, and the religion will suffer as a result. A central tenet guiding forest dhamma meditation practices states that true achievement on the Buddha's path emerges from an internal struggle that involves enormous effort, strict discipline, and unwavering determination. Regardless of one's preferred method of practice, any effort put into meditation that ignores these principles easily becomes aimless and hesitant, which can lead to more mental discord, not less. 
it is imperative to develop enough inner strength to fight against the powerful pushback that comes from the combined forces of greed, aversion, and delusion. When the battle lines are drawn in the heart, only the strongest practitioners will emerge victorious. When I arrived at his monastery, Ajahn Mahabua resided in a small bamboo hut with a thatched grass roof, tucked away at one side of the monastery in a shady grove of tall bamboo trees. Local villagers had just begun to construct a new hardwood residence for him, which they considered to be a more appropriate dwelling given his status as the abbot. I soon jumped right in, uninvited, to lend a hand. The locals were clearing the brush and digging the ground in preparation for laying a foundation. I joined them after the morning meal, raking and leveling the earth, and generally doing groundwork where the wooden posts would be placed. When the workers broke for lunch, I kept raking. When they quit in the afternoon to go home for the night, I had my sights set on working until midnight. I continued to pound the loose soil with a tree stump attached to poles to compact and level the site. After the sun set and dusk enveloped the work area, I pounded the ground by moonlight with such a single-minded focus on the task that I was oblivious to any disruption I might have been causing. Fed up with the constant racket at that quiet hour, Ajahn Mahabua soon appeared in the half-light. He showed surprise at finding me to be the culprit. In a reproachful tone, he said that if it were anyone else, he would kick them out of the monastery straight away. But since I'd lived and practiced with Ajahn Mund, he'd tolerate my behavior just this once. Is this how Ajahn Mund taught you? Was that what the Buddha taught his disciples? No, quite the opposite. Ajahn Mahabua continued his admonition, citing a story from the scriptures about a time when, one evening after dark, the Buddha heard a crowd of people making a loud commotion inside his monastery. The loud, unpleasant clamor sounded like traders noisily hawking their wares. The Buddha told the monk next to him to send the offenders home immediately, with the admonishment that their rowdy behavior at that late hour was detrimental to the monastery's peaceful, quiet environment. Conscientious people are thoughtful of the needs of others and choose to act accordingly. They do not suppose they have a right to disturb the quietude of dedicated practitioners. Practicing monks have the right to expect the monastery to be still and quiet during the evening hours. That is a time when they thrive in a calm and quiet meditation environment. Disturbing that silence wastes their time and causes them difficulties for no good purpose. Noisy activity, when necessary, can wait for daytime. In that instance from the Buddha's time, the disturbance was caused by lay people. How much worse is the offense when the culprit is a monk? Having said that, Ajahn Mahabua quietly walked back to his hut. Early the next morning, I waited for Ajahn Mahabua to arrive at the main pavilion. After bowing respectfully to the Buddha statue, he sat down on the seat prepared for him. I quickly crawled over to where he sat and pulled one of his legs out from under him. Surprised, he demanded to know what I was up to. With tears running down my cheeks, I told him that I wished to bow down at his feet and pay my sincere respects to him. Looking a John Mahabua straight in the eyes, I told him with a sense of wonder that when he reproached me the previous night, he sounded exactly like a John Mon, both in his manner and his expression. I voiced heartfelt regrets about my behavior the night before, and confessed to being totally in the wrong. I submitted wholly to Ajahn Mahabua's authority because he so resembled Ajahn Mon, for whom I had undying reverence. In my entire life as a monk, I had felt afraid in the presence of only two monks, Ajahn Mon and Ajahn Mahabua. That's it. I would not dare to contradict their superior judgment. Much to my delight, I found out from Ajahn Mahabua that Ajahn Kao's forest monastery was situated on the western edge of Udantani province, just a few days' hike to the west. Ajahn Kao had been on my mind ever since I heard Ajahn Mon praise his virtuous character and high Dhamma attainment. The day I arrived at Klong Pain Cave Monastery, I encountered the assembly of monks seated neatly in a row on the floor of a large open-air cave. 
I crept to one end of the line and asked which monk was a John Cao. One of the monks nodded down the line, indicating the head monk at the end. Other than appearing older than the rest, Ajahn Kao did not stand out by his appearance. He seemed to be treated with no special deference, as though he was just another elderly monk at the gathering. This casualness surprised me, and years of living with Ajahn Mond had ingrained in my heart what I considered to be the proper monastic etiquette for this occasion. Oblivious to the glances of everyone present, I humbly crawled on my knees down the line of monks until I reached Ajahn Kao and bowed three times at his feet. Facing Ajahn Kao on my knees with palms raised and a feeling of sincere awe and respect, I begged him to sternly discipline me should I do anything wrong or unseemly. I promised to humbly admit my faults. I asked only that he accept me as a disciple. Later, when I found the right opportunity, I approached Ajahn Kao with questions about his training methods. Since he was an elderly and experienced monk and I was still relatively young at that time, I relished every chance I had to learn from such a true master. At our first meeting, he inquired about the state of my meditation practice. After I described my meditation from the earliest stages to the last stage, he praised my effort and confirmed that my understanding was correct. Even though I had supreme confidence in my Dhamma attainments, I believed it was important for a junior monk to show deference to his elders with a humble attitude. I have often recounted this episode with Ajahn Kao to teach my disciples a lesson. Even though you may believe you are very proficient in meditation, be cautious about trusting your own assessments. Don't fall prey to complacency. Instead, test your understanding against that of an enlightened master. The same applies to body contemplation. Don't simply trust your own judgment. The body must be investigated from every possible angle until one is totally dismayed by the unpleasant reality of physical existence and no longer deludedly grasping the body as me or mine. Several years before my arrival, Ajahn Kao led a small group of Dutanga monks on a trek across the forested mountains in Udontani province. When they reached Klongpain Cave on the lower slopes of the western range, Ajahn Kao found the environment so conducive to meditative seclusion that he decided to settle in the area around the cave. Covered in thick jungle, the whole region was known for its massive boulders and overhanging cliffs. It was a place where caves dotted the landscape and tall, shady trees covered the hillsides. The location was so well suited to Ajahn Kao's temperament that he lived there comfortably for the remainder of his life. During the rainy season retreat that year, I volunteered to build a water reservoir for the monastery, one big enough to catch and hold a large quantity of rainwater for use in the dry season. As I've mentioned, I have a doggedly determined character. When I decide to do something, I put all my energy into completing the task with skill and efficiency, allowing nothing to stand in my way. When the project was nearing completion, I heard news of a big typhoon moving in, so I rushed to finish the work before the storm hit. As nightfall approached, all the monks retired to meditate, but my firmness of purpose was undaunted. I continued to pound rocks with a sledgehammer, breaking them up to line the bottom of the reservoir to prevent leakage during the heavy rainfall. Although the hammering made a loud noise, I pushed ahead undeterred. Such was the nature of my stubbornness. Eventually, Ajahn Kao heard the banging noises and came to investigate. He was not pleased. Why was I working at the wrong hour of the day? Didn't I learn anything from Ajahn Mon? If it wasn't for his respect for Ajahn Mon, he said he would have asked me to leave the monastery and never come back. I felt ashamed at being chastised for a breach of etiquette yet again. Softening his tone, Ajahn Kao proceeded to recount to me a vision that had made a profound impact on his approach to being a responsible leader in the monastic community. In the years before Dutanga monks began to congregate around him to seek his guidance, Ajahn Kao had lived alone in a small forest hermitage, where he preferred to remain aloof and practice in solitude. Seated in meditation there one night, an image of Ajahn Mon peered in his mind. 
In the vision, Ajahn Mond spoke to Ajahn Kao and informed him that he would soon become a respected teacher in the forest tradition and have numerous disciples. He proceeded to advise Ajahn Kao that he should prepare to be a role model for a new generation of practicing monks. In the vision, Ajahn Mond indicated that he had no doubts about Ajahn Kao's Dhamma attainment, but he wanted him to focus on setting an inspiring example for his disciples to follow. He should not assume that the purity of his intentions entitled him to behave in ways that might lead to misunderstanding or disharmony within the monastic community. To maintain his good standing as a leader, he must lead wisely by example and not rely merely on common knowledge about the monastic precepts to set the tone. Soon monks would be looking up to him for leadership and proper training, so he himself had to actively set the right standard. Then his disciples would feel confident that the practices he had taught them were correct and above reproach. Ajahn Kao understood that Ajahn Mund was referring not only to the codified rules of monastic discipline that a monk must observe, but also to the unwritten rules of good deportment that promote faith in skeptics and inspire further confidence in the faithful. He warned him that a teacher should not judge a disciple's conduct solely on the letter of the law and neglect appearances of impropriety that violate the spirit of the Buddha's teachings. In this regard, any discordant personal character traits that a monk exhibits, especially those that run counter to the welfare of the majority, must be firmly admonished by the teacher and brought under control. A John Kao was told to guard his impeccable reputation so that others would say, his Dhamma virtue is exceptionally high. He is entirely beyond reproach. As Ajahn Kao spoke, I reflected on my own recent behavior and how it had caused a disturbance within the monastic community at Klongpain Cave Monastery. Humbled and chagrined by my conduct, I apologized to Ajahn Kao for my failure to live up to the high standards maintained by all the great teachers of our tradition. I determined at that moment, with the purest of intentions, to reform my wayward tendencies. But, alas... Stubborn determination was still an attitude that would often trip me up in the years to come.